Hello, Troy Howarth and Nathaniel Thompson. My first question to kick off this interview is, how did you two get linked up doing audio commentary tracks together? And how many have you done uh, together? So uh, I believe if the sequence is correct in my mind, so several years back, actually, Scorpion releasing was doing a special edition of Dario Argento's opera, and they were trying to find extras, and I sort of occasionally helped them out. And so I was like, well, I'll, I want this to come out so bad. If you just need something, I'll do, a, I'll do a solo track for you just for the heck of it. So I did one. And as anyone who's waiting for that release knows, it sat around for like, I think probably a couple of years, I think, while they were doing all the extras yeah. and some more stuff. And I was like, well, you know, if you, why don't you get Troy? I mean, he wrote this, this you know, amazing multi-volume set of Jolly books. And uh, so Troy wound up being on it. And then we were going back and forth. And then I, and then I think the opportunity came up for Conquest. And he was like, I, I could really use somebody writing shotgun on that one, on the Lucio <laughs> Fulci. And uh, so, yeah, our, our first... Uh, joint track together wound up being Lucio Fulci's Conquest, which <laughs> probably would not have guessed in a million years that would be the beginning of, of this, uh, this whole uh, history. I don't know, how, how many have we done now? I've kind of lost track. What is it, like probably 25, 30? I don't even know now. It's a lot. Probably, probably close to 30. Um, and I think that would have been 2018 that we recorded that, or? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Could he? I don't know. It might even have been last year. You know, it gets it gets so uh, confusing, <laughs> especially when you're cranking as many out as all that. It could have been last summer, for all I know, or last spring, but it might have been 2018. Yeah, I want to say it's like uh, 2018, maybe, but uh, COVID plays tricks with your sense of time, so I don't know. <laughs> it certainly does, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's just, uh, it's funny, I'd started doing them at the tail end of 2015, and I was always working solo, and uh, I wasn't sure how it would work with another person, especially since obviously you're not, re you know, recording with somebody right there. If it would get confusing or there'd be a lot of problems, uh, you know, sparking off of somebody and sort of playing off each other. And uh, uh, that Nathaniel just proved to be perfect uh, uh, sort of co co uh, co talker, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, I don't want to refer to him as a sidekick. <laughs> That's not very fair. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'd say close to 30, I guess, uh, which in a relatively short period of, period of time is uh, not bad. And, of course, we have some more lined up to do as well. Yes, indeed. I just looked up the release date for the Conquest, Conquest Blu-ray, and it was October of last year. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, you never know. I know with the opera, uh, I can relate to Nathaniel because on opera, I, I don't suppose anybody will mind me saying this. I was asked to do it very 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 short notice yeah uh, i'm talking about less than a week's worth of preparation and uh, no. it sat for over a year <laughs> so <laughs> that was a little frustrating but yeah. you know these things happen all right without giving away all the goods of course uh what what, what are some takeaways you wanted to leave uh for listeners for about the your upcoming uh joint commentary track for william lustig's vigilante <laughs> Um, well, I think one of the key things that I, that drew me to wanting to do that particular film, obviously, first of all, the fact that it's not, uh, the type of film that I normally am associated with because I've, I've wanted to try and spread my wings as best as possible and, and try to do an eclectic range of titles. So I'm not just the Jallo guy or not just the Fulci guy or whatever. Mm. Um, and not wanting to kind of. Uh, hog everything in terms of a particular type of, of film or whatever, because that, that sort of thing does go on at times. So uh, I've tried to sort of do a eclectic range of titles. And what I, what really drew me to that one and what excited me about that was just that whole sort of gritty genre of urban thrillers of the 1980s, 70s and 80s, that kind of really gritty, uh, very, uh, at times politically incorrect types of cinema that takes place in a, a version of New York that no longer exists. Mm. Um, so for me, that movie was kind of emblematic of that very particular place and time. These movies are kinds of uh, time capsules of a time that maybe wasn't necessarily better, especially if you were <laughs> living there, I'm sure. Um, but it's something that really doesn't exist anymore and, and uh, something that I thought was really very special and very, again, very emblematic of a particular attitude and at that particular time in, uh, in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And it's also worth noting that, of course, anyone who had the old um, Blu-ray or DVD editions or even the Laserdisc knows, there, there, were, there were two commentary tracks recorded um, years and years and years ago 
for this film, uh, which are both going to be on this release. But so much has happened since then. And I think for both of us, it was worth going to revisit this film because so much has happened. I mean, a lot of major players aren't even with us anymore. We're at Forrest, Carol Lindley, for example. And um, we know so many things about the players and about it that go beyond just the, the production minutiae that you hear in those two tracks. Uh, so yeah, there's also a lot of sort of film history context and things like that we could bring to it. So I think it's a very different beast than the old commentaries that we've had for this film for so many years. Mm, and also too, I think it gave us an opportunity. I, I know at least there was one point we were able to correct something that was yeah. on there that was that was inaccurate, which yeah. inaccuracies are going to happen. I mean, it, mm. uh, Lord knows I've made my own mistakes. <laughs> if I could go back and fix them, I would. But uh, that was kind of a fun thing to be able to say, well, you know, on these other tracks, it said this, but in fact, you know, we'll try to set the record straight where we can and uh, hopefully not add to the, uh, list of mistakes as well in the process. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're 100% correct on the, the correction we have on that track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's a, sort of a funny situation because it's being put out by Blue Underground, but which <laughs> is owned by William Lustig. The guy gets to distribute his own movies. That's kind of funny. Yeah. And you both dealt with William Lustig before. Tell me what he is like to deal with and what he is like as a man. I haven't really had a, a lot of personal interaction with him. I deal with another uh, individual who works through the label, um, a gentleman by the name of Greg. Um, he's my kind of in with the company. And I had started, the, well, the first time I'd been approached by them, I was asked to do liner notes for a Manhattan baby back in, oh God, I don't know, was that 16, 17? Hmm. Um, and uh, that was before, well, no, that was probably, might've even been even further back. I'm not sure though, because it was before I had done any commentary. So I wasn't asked to do a commentary on that, but I did uh, liner notes. Um, and then after that, of course, started doing some commentary work for them. Uh, it's always been reported back to me that he's uh, pleased with what I've done. Obviously, I wouldn't be asked to come back if, if he wasn't. He is the, mm -hmm. the head cheese, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, my, my sense, I'm certainly I've always had a great deal of uh, respect for him, not just as a filmmaker. And I think he, he made uh, several really quite accomplished and quite interesting films, but also as a kind of a cinema uh, kind of uh, historian figure. Uh, he's been responsible for trying to get a lot of these films released and uh, preserved and put out in, in better editions. And uh, right now they're just doing extraordinary work with these uh, these brand new remasterings, going back and doing some titles that really needed major upgrades and doing them beautifully. So my history with Bill is a little different in that for, so for about a decade, I was the brand manager for Image Entertainment, which if you remember that name, they were kind of the forerunner in like Laserdiscs and then DVDs as far as cult labels go. Like, so I would handle things like something weird video and like Ted Michaels films and Euro horror and that kind of stuff. But we were the original distributor for Blue Underground when they started. And I think most people might have forgotten this by now. It used to be common knowledge. But so Bill Lustig actually, um, when he stopped directing, he moved over into home video and he ran, he had his own label on VHS for years called Magnum. Uh, so he was the Suspiria out on VHS, for example, and like the Wicker Man and stuff like that. And Zombie, of course. So, but started working for Anchor Bay and he was the guy who brought in all the European stuff again like Suspiria and Zombie and all the Hammer films and all that and he would do the special features and so then he wound up breaking out from Anchor Bay and he did his own label which was Blue Underground and so I was there at the very beginning watching this happen and like I had to go to the office when they first opened it up and um, he had this like really great crew of folks over there in the early days uh, guys like RJ Galantine and Perry Martin uh, for example and the he brought in a guy to do his special features named David Gregory yeah, which is a name I'm sure all of you know, because then he went off and started Severn Films. So, uh, but it was really funny because the first time I talked to Bill on the phone, because of course I knew who he was, and I love Maniac and Vigilante and Maniac Cop is a big fan. And uh, so I'm sitting at my desk in my office and Bill calls up and, he, and we're chit-chatting about his first, you know, uh, discs that are coming out. We're talking about Dead and Buried and, you know, the Spaghetti Westerns and Baba Yaga and that kind of stuff. And in the background, I hear this like, like music and I'm like... <laughs> And the Exorcist to the Heretic, is that magic and ecstasy? Because you can hear the more like, yeah, 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 going in the background, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, yeah, how'd you know that? And so we went on the whole like Morricone rant for, for a while. Uh, but that was a great way to kick things off there. But he's, he's, he's a real larger than life guy. He's very, uh, very energetic and a lot of fun. He's a total New Yorker, like to the core. Um, it's funny, every time I go to New York, it seems like I'll kind of bump into him because he'll be visiting at the same time and going back and forth. But uh, of course, Blunderground is based in LA uh, still. Um, to this day, uh, which is where I live as well. So, but it's been funny watching Blue Underground like grow over the years, and they they've gone through several several different um, distributors since then. Um, but I'll always have a soft spot just because of uh, 
you know, when I was there right at the very beginning, seeing this uh, baby blue underground being born, it's uh, a pretty cool, special thing. And they're still around. So, yay. A beautiful, perverse baby. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nasty little baby that gave us New York Ripper in 4K. So, you know. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> oh. What, what what makes a William Lustig movie distinctive? Well, I think part of it is uh, there there tends to be a humorous kind of a, a, a sensibility that's present in a lot of his films, and uh, we don't tend to think of something like Maniac, obviously, in terms of being a barrel full of laughs. But it, it, yet, it does have it does have a lot of humor and a lot of sick humor in it, and I, yeah. I think that's something that's very typical of Lustig. Um, you know, un unfortunately, after a certain point, um, as Nathaniel mentioned, he kind of walked away from directing in favor of focusing on preserving other films. Uh, so we don't have as big a body of work with him as, as one would like, perhaps. But uh, I do think that that kind of humorous attitude and, and a kind of cynicism comes through in, in a lot of his films. And uh, I think also a great respect and a great appreciation for old time cult actors. Mm -hmm. uh, which is something that we also see, obviously, now in the films of Tarantino and, and others of that ilk. Um, but he he would always did a really good job with casting some of these wonderful old time actors who have, some of whom hadn't been seen much and hadn't been given great opportunities, and giving them moments to shine in movies that uh, you know, admittedly, are kind of throwbacks in a way to an earlier kind of style of filmmaking. But always, again, with that very very sharp sense of humor, very much in evidence. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he's such a New York filmmaker. I think he's part of that same group as people like Abel Ferrara and Larry Cohen. You know, there's that sensibility that um, w once you sort of used to it, it's always just makes you smile when you watch one of those films. But Lustig is, like you said, a little different. He has this kind of um, kind of a skewed sense of humor. And also, I like the way his films sound. He's very attentive to the sound mix on his movies, which I appreciate, especially something like Maniac. It's actually way more layered than it has to be. Um, a lot of the sort of grindhouse uh, films at the time, they normally have very basic sound mixes. But his is really... Um, he has a really good ear for that kind of thing. And I also like the uh, the Jay Chataway scores that he uses. Um, he's a really good composer, right? It kind of brings that extra something special as well. I think the Vigilante score is um, just fantastic. It's a, it's a shame. I don't know if we'll ever get a soundtrack release, but um, even just in the film, I think it's a really terrific score. It's just, it's part of that overall fabric that he puts together. They're, they're a treat to listen to and watch, I think. Mm, yeah, I'm a big fan of my um, Maniac CD with Jill Spinell's face on it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think I still have my old Verez Saraband vinyl copy of it lying around somewhere. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> what is your personal favorite by William Lustig? I, get, I favor Maniac, although Maniac is not um, necessarily a film to sit down and unwind with <laughs> on, on a regular basis. <laughs> right. um, but it is the, the it is the Joe Spinell film. If you're yeah. a fan of Joe Spinell, that's the film because nothing else i mean you know people tend to forget he was in some of the biggest films of the 1970s he, he worked for coppola he worked for scorsese he worked for spielberg um he was in a lot of the really big films of the 70s it's just kind of a shame that george lucas didn't fit him into star wars somehow or another although <laughs> uh, luigi Pozzi at least got him into the star crash there's something to be said for that um and uh you know i know which one i'd rather revisit but that's another story <laughs> um, but uh he he didn't have many opportunities to really be front and center like that in many films and uh it's just such a remarkable performance and such a remarkably icky movie too it's just it, it i the word that always comes to mind when i think of that movie is sweaty and mm. I, I think that's that's the thing about that film that just always lingers in, in memory. It's a film, you know, it, it just triggers those, those kinds of uh, senses, you know, it, it almost, it, it's a smelly film somehow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm very, very fond of it for that reason. Uh, Vigilante is very close as well, but Maniac is definitely my favorite. Yeah, I, I would qualify it. I would say probably my favorite would be Maniac, but I think Vigilante is the most fun. And I think it's the most underrated mm. Maniac cop too. So take that yeah. for Worth, I guess. All right. Um, so speaking of Maniac Cop, uh, Nicholas Winding Refn is doing a show uh, mm -hmm. based on Maniac Cop. Uh, sort of a strange working relationship in my mind between uh, Refn and Lustig. Um, and um, I personally enjoyed the uh, Maniac remake with Elijah Wood. So what what do you think about uh, re remaking William Lustig material? I think if it looks and feels like too old to die young, it's going to be very strange. <laughs> so, we'll see. I don't know what to expect from that one. I guess we'll see. Yeah, 
curious. Yeah, I mean, like, I love the Maniac remake to death. I mean, it's a very different animal, obviously. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. I mean, obviously, it's going to be much slicker and prettier, more neon soaked, and I'm sure you'll have this. Uh, it'll have an amazing score. That's probably for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Martin, uh, yeah, uh, we'll see. I don't know, but I'm, I'm I'm optimistic. I guess we could certainly use it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not necessarily sold one way or the other, but I'm not opposed to it. I'm not one of the um, the really strong anti remake people, although I. Mm-hmm. I do kind of roll my eyes sometimes. I'm, you know, <laughs> already today I saw yeah, a, a post about all these different movies that are being remade and redone, you know, Hellraiser and uh, uh, The Exorcist. And you, you do sometimes think, oh, <laughs> come Exorcist? on. Wow. Yeah, apparently it's being redone unless it falls apart. You never know. But um, every now and again, you get something that's good. And I suppose even if it's not any good, if it draws any attention to the original and makes people more aware of it, there's something to be said for that. Um, I, I would, I would agree with Nathaniel. I'll we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I would want to prejudge it one way or the other. I'm a little bit skeptical when it comes to uh, Reffin's work in general, although I, I've liked some of it more than others. He certainly has talent, but uh, he's somebody who also, he, he seems to be like Tarantino in a sense. He's constantly saying, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Yeah. And a lot of it doesn't happen. So <clears throat> I guess wait and see what, what happens out of it. But, you know, theoretically, it could be something very interesting and very, uh, very offbeat. So, you know, at least they're doing something different with it. So I, there's something to be said for that. I was listening to William Lustig on a podcast and he was saying they, they had the scripts, they were about to do principal photography and then coronavirus. So we'll see, we'll stay tuned to that one. So William Lustig runs uh, blue underground, as you mentioned, and they, they, they still do a lot of great work, but I remember in the DVD days, they seem to have like every title. And I'm just wondering what happened. A lot more competition now for one thing. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I think we kind of forget just how miraculous some of their early stuff was because, I mean, they brought us like uh, Eugenie, this, this story for Journey and Perversion, the Jess Franco film, which was considered lost, you know, till that came out. So, I mean, they've really performed a lot of miracles in the early days. And that's getting tougher now because you've got so many amazing labels out there kind of jockeying for, for space. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, and, and, and trying to hunt that stuff down now, it's a lot of work. So I, I agree. And I, I see a lot of um, negativity online. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, but there's, there's a lot of, a lot of negativity online about all they do is re-release the same four or five movies anymore. And I, I understand it to an extent. I understand the frustration that people want to see, you know, more and more films, but there are a variety of different factors that come into this. I was talking to somebody from another label about a, a, a very well-regarded Euro cult title that hasn't shown up on Blu-ray yet. And, you know, we're sort of talking about it and, the practical reality is that the person who owns the rights to that film wants a fortune for it. And the the market just can't justify that right now. Whereas this title did get a release back in the booming days of uh, DVD. And uh, the simple reason was that they were willing to pay that kind of money for it then. Whereas now, you know, it's just not worth it. So there's a lot of different factors. As, As Nathaniel says, there's a bunch of different labels that have cropped up in more recent years. Um, they're all doing really interesting work. I mean, if you look at the releases that other companies like Severin or Mondo Macabro or Vinegar Syndrome or some of these other labels that are just sort of starting up, it's an incredibly eclectic array. Um, obviously, if you're a Euro horror enthous- uh, enthusiast like we are, um, it, it sometimes it makes you wonder why are they releasing this title and why are they releasing that title? But you know, there's a market for everything to a certain extent. And I'm one of those people who thinks everything deserves a release. So um, it's, it's nice that everything's being given the good release that's possible. But some of these films, they're not getting re-released on Blu-ray for the simple reason that they can't get access to better elements, uh, which would justify upgrading. So there's a lot of different reasons why these things happen, but uh I, I think anybody who looks at the work that Blue Underground's been doing over the past couple of years with these re-releases of the Fulci films and the Argeno films and, and various other things that they have coming, like Daughters of Darkness, um, it's apparent that they're really doing everything that they can to make sure that they're going to have the best releases possible in terms of bonus features, which is obviously very nice, but also most importantly in terms of the quality of the transfers. Um, 
there is no such thing online as total positivity when it comes to transfers. There's always going to be somebody out there that complains about something. And I've seen um, some rather, I think, ill-informed posts about a couple of the different uh, Fulci discs, for example, complaining about certain things. But um, if, if you know what you're talking about and uh, you really are uh, – tuned in to the reality of it. The amount of work that's gone into this and the amount of detail is just absolutely astonishing that we would have something like the New York Ripper on 4K um, just is astonishing to me. So uh, hats off to them for the great work that they've done. I think they deserve it. And and glorious Dolby Atmos, no less. Indeed. (laughs) Quack, quack, quack. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So let's say William Lustig had the ear of you know uh the the major studios and they say william lustig how do we make our movies more like yours what could they do to incorporate his style into today's cinema well if if you look at the box office like i think we're already sort of heading that way because the studios have been hurting a lot obviously with covid and the drive-in is sort of taking this sort of the the, the menu of choice for a lot of people but you'll notice when you have stuff like the wretched topping the box office because there's no competition (laughs) I think we're going to end plus like they just announced, for example, all the regal theaters are going to be shutting down. I think there's going to be a big sea change when this is over that, that maybe my hope is it'll be more like sort of the 80s and the, even the early 90s where it's a level playing field. And you can have, you know, a much broader spectrum of, of movies playing out there from indies and studio at the same time. So it won't just be like, you know, for the entire month of December, you only have a Star Wars movie playing on every screen, you know, which is. Mm-hmm. So as long as so I think the appetite is there. So like they could say, let's do a lustig style movie. You know, I don't see why not. I mean, I, you do occasionally get these sort of rough and tumble little movies pouring out from studios, but I think we're going to be getting a lot more of it actually. Cause I think people are realizing that they are hungry for that kind of variety and, and that kind of movies with real texture and a sense of location, you know, which is what you get out of his films. Yeah. I think even prior to COVID I've been saying for a long time that, that uh, especially mainstream Hollywood has been going in a direction that's just not going to be sustainable. The budgets are getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, we've reached a point where it's not unusual for films to cost over $100 million, which is just absolutely astonishing. Um, you know, and that calls that, that calls for a certain degree of return, which is not always realistic and which also makes more and more studios unwilling to take chances on quirky films because you know, if you're sinking this much money into a big film, uh, it has to be something that feels like it's a surefire thing. Um, you know, if you look at something like uh, what James Cameron's apparently trying to do with Avatar sequels, although I, I, is there even a market for this at this point? I don't know. But the amount of money that would be sunk into something like that is just absolutely staggering. Um, so I think, you know, if you look at the Lustig model or somebody like uh, Roger Corman before him, you know, mm. kind of similar sensibility with that kind of ironic humor and also making films very quickly and on the fly. Uh, Larry Cohen's another example as well. The, the, you know, it demonstrates that you don't need a lot of money in order to make a good film. Um, there are a variety of different things that go into what makes a good film. It's not always a question of having a great script. There are some films that aren't necessarily great scripts that get by on sheer visual style, for example. There's all kinds of different things that uh, play into this, but out of the whole COVID thing, you know, I would never in a million years want to wish anybody to lose their employment. Um, but I would like to see if, if something's going to happen out of this kind of the, the erosion away from the, uh, the, the chain mentality and get back to a more kind of mom and pop demographic where you have independently owned theaters like they had back in the 80s. Um, and before, obviously, where, you know, you would get a kind of unique bill of fare and where the the uh, studios were not put in a position where, you know, in order to get films put into a theater, they had to have even official sanction from the MPAA. They could put things out even unrated in the 80s. That's how I was able to see Day of the Dead unrated, um, you know, at the tender age of eight. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to see something happen where there's more of a, uh, a mom and pop type of a uh, aesthetic as far as theaters go independently owned and controlled theaters as opposed to big chains all of which are showing the same things at the same time yeah i, can, I gotta say I'd, like i remember as a little kid like i first what i miss is being able to like, walk from a theater and so you have like a two or three screen theater and you've got like ferris bueller's day off playing next door to like night dream to terror you know <laughs> yeah that really happened so <laughs> <laughs> which now it feels like an alien planet where that would happen but you know we could get yeah. back today you never know 
Well, I would love to see that too. And Troy, <laughs> Nathaniel, I want to thank you for your time. Do you have any final words to the subject of William Lustig that you would like to share before I let you go? God bless you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep at it, Bill. And uh, as, uh, anytime you want us, we're available. <laughs> Always happy to contribute. <laughs> And uh, I hope, I, I do hope he gets an opportunity if he has an interest. I don't know, maybe he's not interested, but if he has an interest in going and making another film sometime, I hope he gets an opportunity. And I hope that in our new future of different kinds of cinema experiences, there's an opportunity to actually see a Bill Elastic movie on the big screen. Yeah, Maniac Fury Road, it could happen. There you go. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you.